computer sets, you will a lot of times in industrial settings. Uh, sometimes you're making gears, but also sometimes you're just the man because you can measure, because you're the millwright, you get to set up gears. And it's good to understand what the gears are about. Right now I'm looking at this hypoid gear. And if this were just a straight bevel gear, these would be straight teeth, but on a little bit of an angle. These ones would be on a little bit of an angle. Generally, they're at 45 degrees, so half of each tooth is angled is the normal way they do that. And that would be just a straight bevel gear, straight teeth, a little bit of backlash as they contact each other, and pretty simple. The next development that they had after that to make them a little bit better because they wanted to reduce the backlash is they curved the teeth. Same thing as, as you would have on a helical gear, except it's done on the face. So they made what they called a spiral bevel gear. And the spiral bevel gear is curved teeth. But the big thing is the pinion, being your smaller gear, is in line with the center of the ring. And so that gave some advantage, but they found out that they weren't super strong. So to get more area on the gear, they came above center. Now, one that amount above center is, however, the gear is set when they first form them, when they do the generation between the two on the uh, gear cutting machines and grinding machines. It's not something you're going to change in installation, but it is fixed. Once you're at that point, it is actually fixed. And that's what you're trying to do with looking at patterns is you're trying to get this so that it is in the spot where this pinion lined up with the ring gear when the two were generated. Then you are moving away a little bit to get your backlash to make up for any inaccuracy of teeth placement on the ring gear. Now, where that's important is a couple of places. Um, and I'll say, for instance, while we're here on the automotive side, this is for a nine inch Ford. Real common one today is an 8.8 .8 inch uh, on the Ford versions. And the reason why the nine is more common is because it was one of the earliest ones to be really strong, both because of the pocket bearing, which is out here, gives it a little bit more support, and because it's a long ways off of center, which gives it the most strength. But that also drops away a little bit its efficiency. Being a little bit further over here is where you would be if this was an 8.8. .8. So you gain a little bit in efficiency, but you lose in your total torque available that you can put to it. Either way, let's get back to the idea of we need to set this gear up. So let's say we need to set this gear up and we don't know what the pinion depth is supposed to be. Instead of using bluing, we can actually clamp this down to a mill table, get this where it fits in here, and we can measure from our surface on our pinion to the center line. So we lay this out. You're gonna to have to be sharp enough to figure out how to measure that. I'm not gonna go through that right now. But if you actually measure this, then you can reproduce this depth. And the way you do that is with a bar that goes through where your carrier bearings would be so that that tells you how far it is. You go from that bar, you can measure depth to here, and you can offset that. Now, where I really got into realizing that this was a simple, not a uh, artistic looking for pretty pictures thing, we had some really big industrial high point gears. They were running 400 horse input at roughly 1800 RPM. And I think we had 20 RPM output. So there was a lot of reduction. It was, it was a uh, double planetary and a high point gear set for the primary. <clears throat> anyway, for the high point gear set, we're running 400 horse continuous night and day on this. I don't remember the size of it, but what I found out there it had a cartridge bearing assembly, so the bearings for the pinion were in a complete set and they could slide, the whole pinion could slide in and out with shims behind it, but it also had jacking bolts and bolts to draw it in. It had the same thing holding the ring gear. And the way that it was mounted, the ring gear was uh, on the top of the pinion. There we go. The ring gear was on the top of the pinion. 
So what I would do is I would take this part here, put the cartridge for the bearings in this, leave it loose, put an indicator on top of it, and I would move the pinion in and out. When I got to the perfect location for the perfect pattern, the ring gear would be at its lowest. If I pulled the pinion out, the ring gear would rise up. If I pushed the, ring, the pinion in, the ring gear would rise up. It was, and it really, when you go through that exercise, it really makes it clear to you, what you're doing is you're looking for that one spot where they fit. It's the right spot for how far off center and how far depth. And then it's just a matter, after you have that pinion set, of backing the ring gear off for a little bit of backlash. And I'm sure there's always confusion with hypoid gears, but I hope that makes it a little bit clearer for the machinist millwright community that doesn't normally like to do things just by artistic uh, feeling and looking at little pictures in uh, contact. Which, if you go away from the pictures that are really sketchy, it's pretty simple when you realize what you're trying to do is just get the maximum amount of contact on the gear tooth. Same thing as you're doing with the numbers, making it fit in all the way.